Thank you very much. Okay, so last time we finished with the formula, with the uh, analog of the Gibbs property for the sine process. So let us write again. So we consider the conditional measure, the conditional measure at this moment for the sine process, but in fact, precisely what I want to discuss today is the degree of generality of this result is the, that the conditional measure of, of the sign process by fixing the configuration in the complement of an interval, so fixing the configuration in the complement of an interval, So, uh, in fact, in Pavel's talk yesterday, we uh, saw a detailed explanation, and so I don't need to give it here, a detailed explanation of why the number of particles in the interval is fixed, so of the rigidity of Gauss and Perez. So we have particles x, fixed particles in the environment, in the outside. So x fixed. So we fixed, this is the part of configuration of x in restriction to r without i. This is the interval i. And so the conditional measure is obtained by fixing these and by allowing these to move. Their total number is fixed, as Pavel uh, explained to us uh, yesterday. And so the conditional measure is uh, the following. As we also saw yesterday in, uh, uh, at least we saw some elements of the argument and I will explain uh, the remainder of the argument. Okay, so this is the conditional measure and the infinite product is understood in principal value. So, and I explained uh, yesterday, I think in some detail, that the, uh, uh, the fact on which this um, uh, statement is based is the relationship between palm measures. So the relationship between palm measures of the sign process, which I wrote like this, at x is equal to product of t minus uh, excuse me, product of x minus p, x minus q square x and x. Product is understood in principal value, which in turn was derived from the fact that the palm subspaces, uh, that the palm subspaces are related, so L, so uh, L, the range of the sine kernel, let us recall that the range of the sine kernel is just the Pelevinner space, so the space of functions whose Fourier, Fourier transform is supported on minus pi pi, and so uh, let the, we consider the space Pw of P being the space of functions phi in Pelevinner such that phi of P is equal to zero, and then we have the relation Pw of P is equal to x minus P, x minus Q, Pw of Q. Okay, so and then uh, just yesterday uh, I just said that from this one obtains this, but in fact uh, this step uh, requires a certain effort uh, and I will say very briefly, I will just say very briefly uh, the effort that it takes and then I will illustrate by some examples uh, how in different models uh, one obtains different results. So uh, let, me, let me first explain in the case of the sign process. So uh, okay, uh, maybe uh, to uh, stress immediately the need for some extra effort, let me point out that, so for sine process, this multiplicate function converges in absolute value, uh, excuse me, in principal value, as in fact it is written here. But for example, for airy process, it doesn't. For airy process, this, multi uh, this diverges because the airy particles, well, there are very few in the negative semi axis, there are very many in positive semi axis. So of course, there is a way out of it, there is some need of regularization, and this is exactly what I aim to explain. So what I'm trying to say is that 
In the, so we proved, let me uh, put it on the other blackboard for reference purpose, we proved the statement that if uh, I make a transition, so, so uh, I have a space L and I have a space square root of GL, so, and this is the projection on the space L is denoted by pi, the projection on the space square root of GL is denoted by pi G, then, as we discussed in great detail, uh, the radon nicodym derivative, so the process, the, the determinantal point processes corresponding to pi and to pi g are equivalent, and the radon nicodym derivative is precisely the multiplicative functional corresponding to the function g. The point, however, is that it is often necessary, uh, one often, it is often necessary to consider situations when this multiplicative functional is understood literally diverges. And this uh, the specific example is the example of the array of the array point process where such multiplicative functional will simply diverge. There is a need for regularization. Yes? Is an infinite configuration. Yes? They could be say again, excuse me? No, of course not. It is a it is an infinite configuration. Yes. No. No. Yes. Say again. Excuse me. Again. Yes. That's a quite precise. That's exactly what I'm coming to. So I'm, I'm answering your question right now. When you say airy process or, or airy kernel or sine kernel, those are where the x's are located. In fact, the statement, will be, the statement will be understood almost surely. The convergence will take place almost surely. That's right. Will take place for almost all configurations. And so, uh, as you say, as you say, one needs to play some conditions on the kernel in order that the convergence take place almost surely with respect to this determinant point process. But in fact, as I say, there are some nuances because there are some nuances. So this infinite, let me put it this way. So this statement is completely universal. It's also true for every kernel. It's true for many examples. On the other hand, the multiplicative functional might diverge and does diverge in examples as it diverges for the error kernel. So it does converge for the sine kernel. That's why I started with this example. But for the error kernel, it diverges. So I will need to have a procedure of regularization of this multiplicative function, which I'm now going to explain. Yes, and I have an answer for this. Yes. Yes, here it is. So the axes are uh, the axes are distributed according to the underlying determinal point process. The axes are a realization of the underlying point process of the let's say of the sign process. So they are a realization of the sign process, and I will explain the property of the sign process, which ensures that almost every realization is such that this product converges in principal value. In this case. The measure on the t's is, of course, random because, in fact, that is quite precise. So, because x is a random configuration. Of course, the condition, that's quite precise. A conditional measure is a random measure because the condition itself is random. That's quite precise. Of course, that's exactly right. It's a random measure. That's quite precise. Yes. So, it's a random measure. Yes. So, first I fix a realization of the sign process, and then, so which is a random realization, and then to this realization is assigned the conditional measure. That's quite precise, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I proceed. So, and let me explain, so let me explain. So what is my purpose now? My purpose now is to give meaning to this expression even when the multiplicative function itself diverges. So we shall see right now, and that's what I will explain a little bit briefly, that it is possible 
to have this formula still to be true, even when the multiplicative function itself is not defined, but is defined a weak version of multiplicative functional and regularized multiplicative functional. So, and this is precisely what I'm going to explain, and then I will also illustrate by some examples which show how regularization of multiplicative functionals uh, takes different forms for different models. Regularization of multiplicative functionals. Of multiplicative functionals. So, uh, let me just start with formula. So, I want to consider multiplicative functionals, but multiplicative functionals are Laplace transforms of additive functionals, and so, I, let me start with additive functionals. And so uh, let me first regularize additive functionals. And for this, let me point out that if I have an additive functional, so again, these formulas we saw in uh, Pavel's talk and also in other talks. So if I have an additive functional, uh, then the expectation of the additive functional is, of course, the integral of f. Dt. Let me write off y dy. So for the for this variable, while the variance and this is a formula that we saw uh, several times, the variance of SF is in fact the double integral of f of x minus f of y square times pi of x of y square dx dy. Well, uh, to put it rigorously, d mu of x, d mu of y. Here I am in, uh, this formula holds in the full generality. So I have, that is to say, uh, a projection pi from some L2 e mu onto some subspace L and the corresponding uh, determinantal point process uh, pi. Uh, this is a direct verification using, well, in fact, the definition. Using, in fact, the definition. And, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Pavel wrote to us uh, yesterday a more general uh, formula for arbitrary point process, uh, for, from we, of which this is a corollary, because the first term in the general formula is zero in the determinantal case. Okay, so. One can see by looking attentively at this formula that it is quite possible. So this is essentially a Sobolev one half norm. So in many, in many, yes, or no? Yes. Oh, there is, there is, of course. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. I wrote it. I wrote it. Uh, in yes, of course. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. In fact. I wrote it incorrectly. So uh, the variance is essentially Sobolev one half norm, but it is very easy to give an example of a function for which which fails to be integrable, but for which Sobolev one half norm is finite. It is very possible to have a function which is not integrable, but for which Sobolev one half norm is finite. And to such function, so if f, so let us write the following. Let us consider the map f going to sf minus expectation of sf. So let us denote it by sf, sf bar. And so then this map, f to sf bar, is well defined, is well defined, can, can be extended by continuity for all f, for all f, for which the right hand side of star is finite. But these functions may or may not be integrable. And in fact, the function 1 over x is precisely, is precisely uh, an example, a case in point, where 
this integral is, well, in strict sense not defined, but this integral is perfectly well defined. And so precisely one can define the regularized multiplicative functional at this point. So at this point, a regularized multiplicative functional, a regularized multiplicative functional, multiplicative functional, So let me write it this way. Uh, expectation of exponential SF, let me write it in this way, is, uh, can be defined as, in fact, uh, well, uh, clearly I define it, how do I say? I define exponential of SF bar times uh, exponential of integral of f. Well, this is a tautology, but except it is possible, let me, let me write it this way, excuse me, let me write it this way. Yes, so this is a tautology except this side can be, can be well defined in situations in which neither this nor this is well defined. So this is exactly the same situation as what I wrote, in fact, for, uh, for the Hilbert Carleman, Hilbert Carleman uh, regularization of the determinant. So this is precisely the same situation. This determinant can be well defined when neither this nor this is well defined. <coughs> when neither this nor this is well defined. So, and precisely this, this regularized multiplicative functional is well defined, even in situations when neither this nor this is well defined by a certain limit transition. So, in particular, if, so in particular, yes? I'm doing it, I'm doing it. In particular, exactly, in particular, if a kernel, if a kernel pi on R, on R, satisfies, satisfies what? Satisfies uh, that the integral of pi x x, one plus x squared dx, is less than, is finite, so observe that it is x squared. Yes, so for example, the area kernel satisfies this. Then the regularized, then the regularized multiplicative functional, the regularized multiplicative functional, multiplicative functional, functional, is well defined. So uh, the regularized multiplicative function is well defined. So product regularized x minus p over x is q square. Well, well defined, so is well defined. This one with respect to the measure p Q, of course, yes. So there are there are there is a, a, there are two nuances here. So there is a nuance. There is a nuance at zero. So at Q, at Q. Yes. So uh, the function obviously has a zero at Q. This, however, is not a problem because let us recall that the function P Q x, y, the, for, the formula of Shirai and Takahashi that we wrote uh, last time. Here it is. So uh, this formula uh, shows to us that, in fact, one can see that the, uh, on, the diagonal, on the diagonal at Q, 
uh, the kernel has a zero, in fact, a zero of order two. Not only does it have a zero, it has a zero of order two. So there is no problem, there is no problem with defining uh, the functional, uh, the, uh, there is no problem with the neighborhood of zero. The problem is perhaps with the convergence. The problem is with the convergence, but again, using this regularization, using this regularization and uh, uh, using this formula, using this formula, one uh, can define the regularized multiplicative functional. And so the general, the general form of this statement, so in particular, let's even look at this case. So obviously, again, uh, for a function one over x, for function one over x, this quantity is completely finite. For function one over x, this quantity is completely finite. So the regularized multiplicative functional is well defined, whereas the non-regularized isn't. And so uh, the, uh, the formula holds in complete generality, the formula holds in complete generality uh, with a certain correction, so in full generality, let, let, let me now formulate, so let me now formulate the general, uh, the general case of the formula. Uh, let me erase the procedure of regularization. So the general, the general case of the formula. The general form of the formula. So here, I consider a kernel having integrable form. Or equivalently, a kernel satisfies weak division axiom. Weak division axiom. So if phi is an L of P, then phi over x minus pi is in L. So uh, consider this form. So the other, the other direction is in joint work with Roman Romanov. Uh, so in joint work with Roman Romanov. Okay, so uh, we consider this integrable kernel and we have this regularity assumption. I should say this regularity assumption is sometimes not Verified, I should say. So there is technical difficulty. So let me uh, restrict myself in this discussion to one dimensional real case. But let me point out that this, this formula, this is not verified in one dimensional complex case. Uh, the result is true, but this assumption doesn't hold. In fact, uh, uh, let me uh, allow me, please allow me to restrict uh, myself not to give a rigorous formulation, but to just limit myself to non-rigorous formulation. So in just in the same way as regularization of determinant can go further, so the expression determinant 1 plus a can be regularized further. So one, uh, so one can write it as e to the trace a times determinant 1 plus a. 2 1 plus a, but one can also write it as e to the trace a plus uh, 1 half trace uh, exterior square of a times determinant 3 1 plus a. And the advantage is that determinant 3 1 plus a is at this point defined for operators which are not even Hilbert Schmidt, which are in sh third Schatten class. And so on, one can continue this game. Uh, it doesn't seem necessary in applications. At this, however, the case uh, of so, I mean, going further hasn't been so far necessary in examples, but the case when this example doesn't hold, when this condition doesn't hold, does arise in examples, and, may, and namely when we consider the 
uh, determined by process corresponding to Fox space, which we saw several times at this conference. Uh, when we consider um, just a similar complex uh, situation, one-dimensional complex situation. So let me write it here. So the kernel is by ZW is e to the ZW bar minus epsilon Z square minus W square over 2. So this is just the uh, kernel in the FOC, the reproducing kernel of the FOC space. So what does it mean FOC space? It is space of functions square integrable with respect to the Gaussian weight. So it is generated by monomial z to the k, and so the generating function is like this. OK, so in this case, this assumption will not hold. All the formalism goes through, but regularization must go even one step further, must go to the third, to determinant three. And this was done in joint work with Yan Shi Xiu. So, OK, so let me just uh, point out that, yes, that from here, from here, we have this. So this just follows from the weak division axiom. So there is no question about this. There is, uh, excuse me, I, I wanted to say, excuse me. So this also, but I wanted to say this. So, so the, expression, the expression L of P is equal to X minus P, X minus Q, L of Q. This, this just follows directly from the weak division axiom. From the weak division axiom. And so using the regularization of using the regularization of multiplicative functionals, one is able to obtain this formula in the same way for regularized multiplicative functional. So even if, even if regularized multiplicative functional exists, then this formula still holds. This formula still holds. And then one obtains this same formula, but for regularized multiplicative functional. Regularized multiplicative functional regularized multiplicative functional. And then one obtains this formula. It looks the same, uh, but with important difference. So let me write it by P. It looks the same. But here I put regularized, so not principal value anymore. It's just regularized multiplicative functional. So again, regularized in the sense that the exponential of the trace is subtracted. So this, so uh, in fact, meaning of regularization is very clear. This product diverges, but if you subtract exponential of the trace of the logarithm, it converges. So this is the meaning of regularization. And there is just one more correction term. So I wrote DTI. In fact, I have to write rho of TI, where rho is a function which only depends on rho is a function which only depends on pi. So there is a way. Let me, I wrote rho. Let me denote a W, actually. W pi, excuse me, W pi. So there is this weight function which only depends on pi. So and this, so in this generality, one has this general formula with regularized multiplicative function and with this function W. So this function W, in some examples, it's possible to find it. So let's consider examples. So let me consider an example. Example. So I will consider two examples. One example without regularization and one example with regularization. So example without regularization is example of the Bessel kernel. So Bessel kernel, Bessel kernel, Bessel kernel. So this is the kernel which again we saw several times in uh, uh, the talks today uh, uh, during this conference. So I write square root of x. I write it in slightly different form, but it comes down to the same. OK. Uh, two. Yes. Yes, and also it is even more convenient to write the Bessel kernel in the following form. Is the integral of 1 fourth. 0 to 1, Js, square root of Tx, Js, square root of Ty, dt.
Okay, so what does it mean, Bessel kernel? The Bessel kernel is the kernel of its very similar spectral projection, very similar spectral projection uh, to the sine kernel. So the sine kernel is the spectral projection on Paley Wiener space, which is the space of functions such that the Fourier transform is supported in minus pi pi. Support of the Fourier transform is in minus pi pi. So this is the uh, space for the sine kernel. For the Bessel kernel, instead of the Fourier transform, one has to consider the Henkel transform, HSF of lambda is equal to one half integral from zero to infinity F of R Js square root of lambda r dr. And by the way, in many sources, for example, on Wikipedia, if you read uh, the definition of Hankel transform, it's for some re reason written as bigger than one half. And I could never understand why people write as bigger than one half. In fact, it's perfectly well defined if s is bigger than minus one. So it is really a source of great mystery to me why, why people write s as bigger than minus one half, as bigger than minus one. Strictly bigger than minus one, it's Hankel transform, perfectly well defined, and it's involutive. So the Fourier transform, you have the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, but for Hankel transform, it is just uh, an involution. It is just an involution, it's wonderful transform, so it's obviously just as the Fourier transform, it's a spectral projection uh, corresponding to the operator of the Bessel equation. Uh, let me not write it down, uh, we don't need it for the purpose of this class. The point is that, of course, well, the kernel is integrable, here it is, you can see that the kernel is integrable. The kernel arises, of course, as scaling limit of orthogonal polynomials, indeed, which orthogonal polynomials? Uh, the, for, one can consider either Jacobi polynomials, Jacobi polynomials, or uh, Laguerre polynomials. For computations, it's often easier to work with Laguerre polynomials. But Jacobi polynomials come down to the same. So this is classical asymptotic of Heine Mehler, Heine Mehler asymptotics, 1847. Uh, just Jacobi polynomials converge to Bessel function. And one can see it very nicely Jacobi equation converges to Bessel equation. Uh, so there is spectral projection. Uh, there are, uh, so excuse me, just as uh, Hermite polynomials converge to the sine function. Uh, Jacobi polynomials converge to the Bessel function, so it shouldn't very greatly surprise us that the christoffel darboux kernel converges to this kernel, so the kernel has integrable form. So, again, it shouldn't very greatly surprise us that the weak division axiom holds. Well, it comes down to the same. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, also the relation between palm measures holds. So this is just a corollary of the weak division axiom. And the corollary of the weak division axiom. And at this point, also this result holds. In fact, here there is no regularization. The multiplicative functional converges in normal way. So, in fact, here the one can check that the integral of Js xx over 1 over x, 1 plus x, is finite. Is finite. One can check this. So this is maybe clearest from here because uh, one can see that there is a certain power decay for the uh, Bessel kernel. It decays in a power way. Well, it's also clear here. So one can, maybe easiest if one writes it with derivatives. And then uh, it is still clear that there is a little bit of power decay. And which, however, is enough to have this formula. So the, all the products converge literally, and the function rho pi, or w pi, w pi of t is equal to t to the s. Is equal to t to the s. The function w pi t is equal to t to the s. Okay, so this much, this much for the Bessel kernel, it all holds literally here. So, second example I would like to consider is the gamma kernel. The gamma kernel of Borodin and Alshansky, where, in fact, regularization takes a certain form. So, gamma kernel. Yes, yes. Sorry, excuse me again. 
Sorry, excuse me. Quit. Ah, W. Uh, okay, this is a very good question. So uh, in this case, so okay, so the function comes from. Okay, this is a very good question. So let us let us look at this formula for orthogonal polynomial ensemble as we wrote last time. So there we had regularization. This is an excellent question. So uh, there we had uh, the formula. So there we had the formula. Uh, So let us recall for orthogonal polynomial ensemble, orthogonal polynomial ensemble, we had the formula dp P over dpq is the weight of the ensemble, the weight of the ensemble at p over k n p p of w q over k n q q times this product. So this is how the formula looks for the orthogonal polynomial ensemble. So to guess the weight, one needs to take the limit of these. To take the weight, one needs to take the limit of these, which is trickier if one has regularization. So if one doesn't have regularization, it is straightforward. If it has re regularization, it is trickier. Okay. Yes. Does does it make sense? Good. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, <coughs> Now, let me just say, the, so let me introduce the gamma kernel of Borodin and Elshansky, so obtained as limit of Z measures about which Pierre spoke to us on Monday and uh, just uh, discrete kernel on Z, gamma kernel, gamma kernel. So uh, it is again an integrable expression with gamma functions. So I will write a z z prime of x is gamma of z plus x over square root of gamma z plus x z prime of x. I write it in this way so that this expression is well defined as we saw in the talk of Pierre, either when z is equal to z, z prime is equal to z bar, or when z, z prime all lie in the same interval m, m plus one. There is also a discrete series, but let's skip that for the time being. By the way, uh, what Pierre did not say, but it should be said that uh, the z measures arise in the representation theory are intimately connected to representation theory of SL2R. So the terms principal series and complementary series and discrete series, these are in fact principal representations of SL2R. Uh, complementary representation of SL2R and so forth. So, and I write, so the gamma kernel, K Z Z prime of X Y is the kernel sine PZ, sine PZ prime, so pi, is, pi Z minus Z prime, times a z z prime of x a z z prime of y minus a z z prime of y a z z prime of x. So this is the gamma kernel. So, and this kernel, as I said, it, uh, it arises from a measure on partitions. So observe that it has integrable form. So by definition, the kernel has integrable form. It arises from uh, measures on partitions. So it should not very greatly surprise us that there are very few particles on the positive semi-axis and very many particles on the negative semi-axis in such a way that kxx is 1 over x as x goes to plus infinity and kxx is 1 minus 1 over x as x goes to minus infinity. So again, uh, let us recall that we are having 
just Young diagrams, and in Young diagrams, there are very many holes, very many particles here. Okay, as usual, I miss. Yes, no, no, uh, I wrote correctly, excuse me, no, that's quite precise. I wrote correctly, so I have not, to my own surprise, I have not confused particles and holes. So, okay. Okay, so there are very many holes here, very many particles here, and so this is the gamma kernel. And so clearly, this multiplicative functional is not defined. The regularized multiplicative functional, however, is defined, and regularization will in this play, in this case, regularization will take the following form. So regularization, regularization will take the following form. To regularize the quantity when there are too many particles for things to converge, one regularizes it in the following way. So the, I take product of g of x over particles, so x bigger than zero. And then I take inverse of y over holes. y less than zero, so here is x in x, y not in x. So, on the, so in the positive semi-axis I have very many particles. Oh, excuse me, the opposite. I have very few particles. I have very few particles, so I can take product over those. On the negative semi-axis, on the other hand, I have very many holes, so I can take product over those. In fact, when I subtract the exponential, so let me, uh, let me formulate it like this. When I subtract exponential of the trace, I subtract a term corresponding to the set where, uh, corresponding to the configuration where all these are particles. I subtract all, so to speak, all the particles. So what remains is where I have the holes. So, and this is the regularization for the multiplicative functional. And I think I mentioned, and uh, uh, let me say this again, I mentioned that this whole subject started from a question of Olshansky. In fact, Olshansky in 2011 treated the gamma kernel, so Olshansky treated in 2011, the action of the infinite symmetric group on the gamma kernel, on the point process with the gamma kernel, and he proved this formula for this specific G, he proved this formula. So for this specific case, by taking limit transition from Young diagrams. So in fact, the, uh, uh, the uh, expression, this expression, can be written down explicitly for Young diagrams. So he has that measure, one can then write explicitly this product expression. And uh, so he, he wrote this expression and then he asked me what happens for the sign process and well, here is the answer. Okay, so here uh, finishing with the examples, please allow me to pursue a digression. So in these two examples, so the Bessel kernel and the gamma kernel, one sees a one observes a phenomenon for which I would like to have a more conceptual explanation. So the phenomenon is the follows. So the Bessel kernels, it's not just, it's obviously, well, a family of Bessel kernels, but in fact, it's not just a family, it's a hierarchy of Bessel kernels. So let me point out that Js of xy is equal to, uh, is equal to Js plus 2 of xy plus s plus 1 square root of x, let me write it like this, s plus 1, j s plus 1 square root of x, square root of x, j a s plus 1 square root of y, square root of y. Okay, so Bessel kernel with index s is a rank one perturbation of Bessel kernel with index s plus two. And so here, well, as speaker I get question, but here I would like to ask a question to the experts in the audience. So uh, to every such uh, determinantal point process there corresponds a integrable system, unless I'm mistaken. So the, uh, the determinant, the, the, the gap probability, the determinant is a solution, a solution of some integrable system. So my question is what, so here I have a hierarchy of kernels, what is the corresponding hierarchy on the level of integrable systems? Here's a question just I would like to ask. Okay, so uh, 
uh, yes, so observe that the, so corollary, corollary, that the sequence, the sequence square root of R, JS, uh, excuse me, yes, J, square root of R, JR of square root of X over square root of X, forms an orthogonal basis, forms an orthogonal basis, an orthogonal, orthonormal basis, for the range of JS. So the convenience of this orthonormal basis is that it's iterative. So it's a basis, so R, R uh, takes values, so R takes values S plus 1, S plus 3, and so on. S plus 1, S plus 3, S plus 5, and so on. So, but observe that this basis is iterative. This basis is iterative. So, just uh, if I take S plus 2, then there is one element less. So, well, and clearly, in fact, it is also clear from this formula. Clearly, of course, the Bessel kernels, they go to 0 as S goes to infinity. They weakly converge to 0. So, there is, everything is consistent. And let me just say that this, uh, this perturbative statement can also be expressed on the level of multiplicative functional. So, uh, with the, after this, it should not be very surprising. So, in fact, I can also have with palm measures, I can also say that palm measure, so the palm space, so let me write for this time, Ls is the range of Js. So the palm space of Ls, Ls of p, which is by definition, excuse me, let me write it here. So Ls of p, as always, the palm space, Ls of p, the palm space, that is to say, f in Ls, f of p equals 0. So I can write Ls of p is, in fact, equal to x minus p over x, Ls plus 2. So this is formula I can write. So in fact, there is a, there is a uh, recurren this recurrence relation. It ha makes perfect sense in terms of palm theory. So the next Bessel kernel is obtained by adding a particle to the, to the previous Bessel kernel. In fact, you can see it's a rank one perturbation. It's rank one perturbation. So I add one more particle to the previous Bessel kernel. Here it is, right? So that is to say that the palm measure of this one is equivalent to this one. Palm measure of this one is equivalent to this one. Okay, and so here it can be written explicitly. And so then there is a corollary uh, which is published in Proceedings of the Stekloff Institute. So just the corollary in 2016, the corollary is that, well, of course, the corresponding measure, the palm measure at point P is absolutely continuous with respect to the palm measure. Oh, excuse me, with respect to the measure with shifted parameter. And the Radonnikov dim derivative is just x minus P over x square, x in x, well, with some normalization constants at it. Here it is just normal, normal product without any anything. So normal product. Okay, so this much for the Bessel kernel. And uh, let me also very briefly say uh, that the same result uh, is obtained in recent joint work with Olshansky uh, from 2019 also for the gamma kernel. So let me, let's think that we already remember the regularization, the scheme of regularization. Uh, okay, I raise this also. So for gamma kernel, in joint work with Olshansky uh, 2009, it's on the archive, Olshansky and 2000, joint work from 2019. So uh, just uh, same statement for the gamma kernel. So we can have also, uh, there is a little uh, nuance here. We can have an iterative basis, so let me write it down.
is some constant of zz prime, which let me not even bother writing down, uh, times ax plus z times uh, gamma x plus z prime plus m x plus z plus m plus 1. So I should say in the paper, of course, uh, with Olshansky, we use the Notation of Olshansky where there are one halves everywhere. So everywhere in all the formulas with every integer there is one half, one half, one half, one half, one half, everywhere. So I, I skip them in this uh, presentation. So just uh, there is this basis and then one can write k x y, uh, k yes, z z prime x y. So for the gamma kernel one can write this representation explicitly. It is an inductive representation, gm z z prime of x, j, z prime of y. So, so uh, the sum is from m equals 0 to infinity. This gives in turn, so this basis is orthogonal basis. It's orthogonal basis for z equals to z prime bar. So in Principal series is orthogonal basis, and the situation is completely the same as in the Bessel case. It's orthogonal. It's orthogonal basis, and uh, so orthogonal inductive basis. In complementary series, it's not orthogonal basis. It's bi-orthogonal basis. It's not orthogonal. It's bi-orthogonal basis. Okay. However, this may be one obtains a recurrence relation very similar to uh, the one for Bessel K. Uh, ZZ prime, okay, let me write it here. I erase the definition of the gamma kernel. We already remember it. So let me write it here. So the <coughs> KZZ prime of XY is equal to G0 of x, g0 of y, well, obviously, that's at prime. So, and there is, uh, there is a, well, the next kernel, plus k, uh, z plus 1, z prime plus 1. But there is a, a little nuance for the gamma kernel, namely, there is a shift. So there is a shift, uh, uh, a twist, a gauge transformation, a z, z prime of x, a, z plus 1, z plus, prime plus 1 of y, uh, excuse me, of x, I wanted to say, and the other, the same thing of y, a, z plus 1, z prime plus 1 of y, a, z, z prime of y. So this is just the formula for gamma kernel. Observe that, well, it is a little bit twisted. This twist is twist by function of absolute value 1 in orthogonal case, but in a non-orthogonal case, this function is not of absolute value 1. And also, by the way, I take advantage to ask a question uh, to the experts in the audience. So what would be the integrable system corresponding to the gamma kernel? What would be just the gap determinant for the gamma kernel? Is it possible to, is it possible to write, I don't know, Pendleve equation which corresponds to it? So, or is it possible to write some, uh, how to say, the integrable system that lies behind this kernel. Okay, and in particular, so from this hierarchy, we also obtain, again, that uh, the palm measure, the palm measure, so let me just not write the formula, let me refer to the, pre uh, to the preprint, but again, the palm measure, the palm measure of gamma kernel, measure of the gamma kernel of P, K, Z, is equivalent up to an explicitly written multiplicative functional. In fact, multiplicative functional is always the same. Multiplicative functional is the same, just it has to be understood in a regularized sense. Is equivalent to P, K, Z plus 1, Z prime plus 1. So there is the same hierarchy in this gamma case also. And in concluding this digression, uh, let me put a digression on a digression. So uh, just uh, let me say that with this, 
with this hierarchy, it is possible to construct an analog of determinantal measures, but which are not finite, but sigma finite. So, and uh, let, me, uh, let me say this, and with this I will finish. So, uh, it is possible to construct an object which I call infinite determinantal measures. Infinite determinantal measures. So, in fact, uh, the need for this object came from uh, the following construction of Borodin and Alshansky, who observed that uh, the Bessel kernel, the Bessel kernel arises in question of uh, ergodic decomposition of measure on the space of infinite matrices. Let, uh, for lack of time, please allow me to be very brief here. So they consider space of matrices, uh, space of measures on matrices, which I will write now. So this is a sequence of measures, CN, sequence of measures on just space of matrices, complex matrices. So let me point out that uh, these measures are finite when S is bigger than minus 1, so finite. So these measures arise, in fact, so if S is equal to 0, this is very specific measure. This is measure, so what does it mean, space of matrices? Space of matrices, it is in fact complex Grassmannian. So if you think about it, think about uh, complex, uh, think, uh, think about manifold CN in C2N. What does it mean? Manifold of half dimension. Manifold of half dimension is graph of a map. So this graph of a map is precisely a matrix n times n. So Grassmannian, so, so a flat coordinate on Grassmannian precisely identifies the Grassmannian with the space of matrices n times n complex matrices. n times n complex matrices is identified with Grassmannian, complex Grassmannian to n n. Uh, up to, obviously, up to some negligible sets. Then the canonical invariant measure on the Grassmannian is identified with precisely this measure, but with s equals zero. So Grassmannian carries a canonical invariant measure, uh, so it is homogeneous space, u, n cro uh, cross u to n, uh, double quotient of u, and it carries canonical invariant measure. So this canonical invariant measure, under passing to the flat coordinate, becomes this. The canonical invariant measure of the Grassmannian tautologically is unitarily invariant and tautologically is projection equivariant. Tautologically, if I take Grassmannian of dimension n plus 1 and project of Grassmannian of dimension n, the measures, the invariant measures, will also project. So one obtains that these measures are also projectively equivariant. The miracle is that the property of projection equivariant preserves for all S. So for this miracle, I don't have convincing explanation. It's possible to write some other measure on Grassmannian. Uh, it's possible also to see this in terms of some Gaussian distribution, and then somehow, instead of Laguerre polynomials with S equals 0, consider Laguerre polynomials with, well, S equal S, something like this. But I don't have conceptual explanation why these measures actually arise. So, but these measures do arise. This is a sequence of measures projectively, projectively equivariant. So that is to say, from matrix of order n plus 1, I pass to matrix from order n, then the measures are, one measure is taken onto the next measure. By the way, open question. These are the only ones, multiplicative in eigenvalues and projectively equivariant. Open question. I have, no, there is some result of this type by Rashkovskaya for, Z measures, but for these measures, nothing. So open question, these, that they are canonical in this sense. However, this may be, these measures exist on infinite matrices, so, so this projective family of measures define, define a measure on space of infinite matrices. And this measure, decomposing this measure into ergodic components gives Bessel process. Nonetheless, so the, it's very nice, but uh, this measure can also be defined when it is infinite. So if S is less than minus 1, the measure is still well defined. Measure still well defined. Still well defined. Measure still well defined. So it will be infinite measure, but all infinity will live only for some small values of n. 
If n is sufficiently large, then the fibers, so as I mentioned, we consider projective family of measures, then the fibers will have actually finite measure. So the measure on space of infinite matrices will be well defined. So there is question of ergodic decomposition, and it would have to be infinite measure on space of configurations. And in fact, infinite measure on space of configurations can be constructed. So uh, it has been constructed. So this was question of Borodin Alchansky. Uh, so our answer to this question of Borodin Alchansky can be constructed by iterating this procedure still further. It is possible to iterate this procedure still further. So to perturb a determinantal kernel, to perturb a determinantal kernel by a non-square integrable function. Or in other words, to consider a measure of which palm measures are determinantal, but it, the measure, is sigma finite. So in fact, it is possible to check that perturbing, perturbing a uh, determinantal measure by non-square integrable function, considering perturbation by projection, adding an unbounded operator, not, not perturbing it by rank one operator, but perturbing it by unbounded operator, corresponds to adding a particle to my configuration, but this particle, so to speak, the probability that this particle approaches the edge grows and grows and grows, and in fact is infinite. And so instead of determinantal measures, or by the way, equivalent way of seeing this uh, infinite determinantal measure is the just product of determinantal measure by multiplicative functional, which converges, which converges, but is not square integrable. So then the space square root of GL will no longer be space of integrable functions. The space will be well defined, but, it, but the function, so it's quite easy to have some space of, in L2 and then multiply it by some function in such a way that the space is no longer space of square integrable functions, space of functions of wh whose norm is infinite. And to such object will correspond analog of determinantal measure, but which will be infinite, which has all the properties of determinantal measures, which becomes determinantal measure under taming. So one can tame in different ways, obtain different determinantal measures, but the object is one. And to such perturbation of, uh, fi uh, to such finite rank perturbation of Hilbert space by non integrable functions, one obtain finite particle perturbation of determinantal measure an infinite determinantal measure. Thank you very much.